All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the longest running show in the world about data. It's called DM Radio. Yours truly, Eric Kavanaugh here with an all-star cast. We have Sam Holzman. We have Hyone Park. We have Jim Stern and Joseph Gaska. I'll have them all introduce themselves as we go around the room here. But we're going to talk about the hottest topic. It's machine learning. The machines are learning. They are kind of learning, which is kind of freaky. So the models are learning, I guess. It's not really the machines that are learning. It's the models that are learning, right? They're learning behavioral patterns. They're acting on things. And that's kind of what I want to dive into today is these AI agents, otherwise known as agentic AI. It was called interactive AI when the year began. And a few weeks later, it became agentic AI. So now everyone's talking about AI agents. Salesforce just had their big agent force announcement, which was pretty interesting. It does look pretty good. These agents can do some interesting things. My big question to all of our guests today is how are we going to manage these little critters? How are we going to monitor these things? Is it log files and then agents managing log files and the orchestration of these things? It's going to be pretty interesting. Salesforce said that, I guess, Atlas is their reasoning engine. And Atlas is the orchestrator, I suppose, of all the agents that do various things. And what I've heard is that typically you want the agents to do one specific thing and do it very, very well. Learn to do it, do it well, and then pass on to another agent when that task is done, which is kind of how humans work in the real world. But let's go around the room and introduce ourselves and uh, give your opening statement or argument, and we'll go from there. Samuel Holzman, I'll throw it over to you first. Uh, managing the machines, what do we do next? Thank you, Eric. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I want to take uh, your audience back to April 4th, 2017. April 4th, 2017. Somebody that most of you probably know, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, vented the web. It wasn't somebody else, but it was Tim Berners-Lee. And he said, I'm reading off my script here, a tipping point could be reached where people realize the data belongs to me. And that's where we're at right now. And so when it comes to these AI agents, I want to remind everybody that an application, a system is made up of four components. The procedure division, which is really where that agent engine really does well. The person machine interface division, not sure about that one. The machine to machine interface division, that one's pretty good. And then the last one is the data division. And that's where, if I can be blunt, we, the community has a real problem. Mm -hmm. And we know that because of the phrases that we're hearing, model collapse, hallucinations, and all these other things. So with all this enthusiasm, I wanna mention that the key thing is data. So within this activity here, I believe that what we're gonna be doing is using these marvelous technologies with quote, our own data, rather than these large language models. And that's where the real best practices and learning comes into play. Yeah, good good opening statement. Let's go around the room here. Jim Stern from Targeting. Uh, tell us about yourself real quick and uh, what you think is happening. How are we gonna manage the machines? We are gonna use the machines to manage the machines. Um, <laughs> my introduction is for the last 23 years, I've been running the Marketing Analytics Summit Conference. Um, that because the website experience was so bad, I said, look, let's measure what you're doing. That led to predictive analytics and machine learning. A book behind me, Artificial Intelligence for Marketing was from 2017 because it was machine learning. Um, AI now means uh, generative AI. So I have strong opinions on that that I'll be happy to share at the drop of a hat. <laughs> well, share your first one, then we'll go around the rest of the room. What's your first strong opinion about? Uh, first strong opinion is that we're using it wrong. We're 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 complaining about these generic uh, generative AI systems as not being able to, you know, how many R's are there in the word strawberry? It's that's that's wearing roller skates to the bowling rink. It's not a good idea. But if you lean into the hallucinations, to the fact that it's a creativity machine, that's a whole different ball game and something that. Um, is is the new horizon that we haven't yet delved into to quote yeah. chat GPT. <laughs> That's right. That's his favorite word. I use that just today. I joked that uh, if you see the word delve, it's like, mm, that's probably from chat GPT. It loves to delve. Uh, and <laughs> next we have Joe Gaska from Grax, who's been on the show a few times over the years. And Joe, you, of course, you work in the Salesforce arena as backup for Salesforce. You've got a lot of cool technology to do that. And I remember saving files in Parquet format to enable analytics. You've done a lot of clever things over the years 
and uh, Salesforce. So Agent Force, Atlas is going to be the orchestrator. It looks like it's doing some pretty good things, but what are your thoughts on uh, what's happening now and how are we going to manage the machines? Oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, Joe Gasco, Crax, CEO and founder, and we are definitely in the Salesforce ecosystem and it's great to see the market moving as fast as it is. One of the biggest things that we've always found in kind of working and how it's evolving very quickly is historical data is really the training set for what we're driving a lot of these actions on, whether it's autonomous or agents or business processes. It comes down to basically almost signal processing, right? So what are the signals? What are the what are the what are the pieces that are feeding in? We're all about collecting the highest fidelity and the highest frequency of Salesforce data capturing it and storing it securely in a customer's cloud. And really now we get in, now people are really looking at driving, driving autonomy or what's the next best action, right? Whether it be through lead scoring, lead velocity, opportunity scoring, opportunity velocity, CSAT scores, the deviation, you know, what is the next best action? We're seeing a lot of people really looking at what is not, what is just, what is not the action, but what's the data being fed in and how do I make the proper predictions and what are the data? It's all coming down it's all coming down, like Sam said, to the data, right? The data itself, you can get a lot of technology, bad data in, bad data out, but if you don't have yeah. enough history to do the predictions and kind of the actions, that's really where we're seeing the biggest growth right now by far. Yeah, and, and that resonates with what Sam was talking about too. Well, uh, Heon Park, Amalgam Insights, you're an industry analyst. You track all this stuff and you're traveling constantly. You uh, must have a lot of miles on <laughs> yeah. your on your plan. So yes. you've got some vacations planned, I'm sure. But Absolutely. What, what do you see happening? I mean, you're one of the smarter guys I know. Well, how are we going to manage the machines? First of all, Eric, sorry, sorry that that's the case for you. I hope you beat many smarter people. <laughs> Luckily, we've got some other smart people uh, in the room with us right now. Um, but I've been looking at AI, you know, on and off for about 25 years. I started in computational chemistry, where we looked at multivariate optimizations for protein folding. It ends up a lot of this math ended up being useful for personalization at the end of the day, as we tried to figure out how the, you get thousands of signals and turn them into the right thing for the right person at the right time. So mm. I, I just happened to learn the math early enough in my career to uh, be able to use that for the rest of my life. Uh, just a lucky, lucky guess there. But um, you know, since I've been looking at this, we've gone from that optimization to looking at predictive analytics, machine learning, modeling, and now we have these more generative AI and transformer-based approaches. And as we've gone through all of that, you know, I feel like the one big uh, mistake we make is always thinking that we are making these evolutionary steps towards pure automation. Whereas I think like Jim said, we're actually moving towards different types of computing usage. Uh, one of the things that I throw out most often is that I think the biggest mistake people talk about in AI is the idea of eliminating bias. Um, I, mm. I think that's an awful phrase. Anybody who knows the math knows it's impossible to eliminate bias. And what you are really trying to do is confirm biases, document biases, and make that a part of your thinking process going forward. And I, I'm sure I, I see Jim, you nodding like like this is a this is actually a big problem because uh, the more we try to eliminate bias and try to get to a single truth, the more difficult it will be for us to use Gen AI. So I'm just tossing that out there. Um, there's there's a whole lot of other things we can talk about, agents, ROI projects, but um, yeah, uh, let's get into this. Yeah, well, Jim, why don't you comment on that? Because I think that's what you're talking about when you talk about leaning into the hallucinations, right? So a couple of things. First of all, uh, bias in the data, it exists, it's true. It is the nature of nature, if if you will. Um, and you can't get rid of it. The only way to get rid of bias is if the machine agrees with everything you say. And then there, <laughs> then it's not biased. So we have to imbue these systems That's with fun. values. And then the question is, okay, well, whose values? <laughs> um, we're humans. Everybody has different values. Every culture, every city, every country has different values. And so identifying the biases so that you can account for them is, um, that's, that's what I was nodding in agreement with because it's the uh, getting rid of bias is hopeless. It's not pot. For, forget mathematically, it's not humanly possible. Right. So acknowledging them and recognizing where the output is biased is where the value is going to be. 
That's pretty interesting. That's an interesting take. Uh, Sam Holzman, I'll throw you uh, into the mix on that one. Uh, I do fully appreciate what these gentlemen are saying. There, There is going to be some, there are different kinds of bias, of course, but there's going to be some leaning in some direction or other. That doesn't mean it's a bad algorithm, for example. It could be. It could be just it's a sloppy algorithm. But, you know, what do you think about this concept of appropriate use of the technologies and appropriate guardrails? Well, this is where we get into uh, what we call EAI. I'm not trying to throw fancy new terms out there. Uh, enterprise amalgamated information. Sorry, mm. guys. And that's because I don't think that AI, A, remember what the AI stand, the A stands for? Artificial, yeah. Which means phony. <laughs> okay. So what we believe is this powerful engine, tremendous engine, and as Jim mentioned, also, there's going to be bias. Well, we want enterprise bias to be worked on rather than trying to sort out the nonsense that's out there and trying to filter out, well, is this true or is that true? Is this true? Is that true? So we're trying to bring this in-house. And I also want to mention that in this world of data that we're talking about, there's four types of data that these engines are being trained on. One is the internet data. Of course, we all know that. I used to, I like to call it data sludge. That's what I call it. It's unfortunate, but it gets the point across. The next is evildoer data, <laughs> copyrighted data that is being used illegally. Of course, this drives me nuts, probably drives a lot of people crazy because they're stealing from all of us. Mm. Now, even with that, there's a third and fourth category. The third is what I call balanced, balanced information an exchange. In other words, to get on this webinar, you ask for an email. You ask for an email. The only way the people get onto this webinar is if they give you an honest email. It's a balanced exchange of information. There's a, there's a, a, a value. The fourth one, notice I'm smiling here, is best practices. And everyone needs to recognize nobody, nobody is going to put their best practices on the general internet because that costs money. Hmm. So what we wanna do is to leverage these tremendous engines that we're having. And we know that even with us, there's bias, in other words, internally, but we're gonna leverage that because we know where that data is coming from. Hmm. Pretty exciting times when we get past the hype. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a real good point. And maybe Jim, I'll throw this back over to you because you're in this industry and you're trying to improve results for folks, you know, target marketing, for example, personalization, knowing whom to send an email to. I mean, I've been doing email marketing for 24 years now. It's longer than most people. And uh, it's gotten significantly harder, especially in the last year or two. I've noticed significant changes in behavior for email marketing. It's probably because of social media. It's also because the, the big engines like Gmail and Yahoo are trying to tamp down on spam and things of this nature. And they're doing so in, in relatively clumsy ways in some senses. But I, I think um, I think that Sam made a couple of good points there. What do you think about this balanced information and best practices? Um, the balance of information flow is the fair exchange of value, which is the solution to privacy. Um, you can't have any information about me unless you offer me something in return. So Amazon was the first one to say, hey, give us your email address and tell us who your favorite authors are. And it's like, oh, great. So you can spam me. In exchange, yeah. <laughs> we'll tell you when your favorite author is about to have a book released you will be the first on your block to know, and we'll give you a discount for buying it in advance. And you'll be one of the first people to get it on the planet. That's a service. That's not spam. That's something mm -hmm. I want. Uh, at the same time, the Bank of America said, fill out this form and we'll send you our newsletter. And the form included household income and age and, and education and how many children and how many cars. It's like, that's not a fair exchange of information. I don't want your newsletter. Thank you. No. So the, the balance of exchange of information is is crucial. Um, it also is going to ensure that the data that we receive as companies is as good as can be. Right. Because if you look at your email database, you'll see there's a lot of Daffy Ducks and, and Mickey Mouses. 
Right. Yeah, I've I've looked at that data. I see because I check all these shows mm -hmm. and I see people whose phone numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm like, yeah, that's oh, my that's number. interesting. <laughs> the uh, two, three, four area code. Yes, I'm very familiar with that. <laughs> and a very, very clever marketing too. Dial one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now okay. call now. <laughs> it's it's good stuff. But uh, maybe Hayan, I'll throw it over to you on the ethical concerns here. Jim and Sam both make good points. Ethically, if you're doing something as a service and you are considering the customer, people talk about being customer centric and all this stuff, just being a decent human being doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's basic business practice. And I think it really does come into play with using AI, using personalization and having checkpoints along the way to make sure you're doing the right thing. What do you think, Hayan? Yeah. So I Ethics is always a very tricky area because you've got a combination of data where I, I'm really chomping at the bit at, to hear Joe's perspective on this, actually, um, uh, where data is uh, going to be an important uh, aspect of how honest your data, how trusted is the data, how protected is the data. Uh, you're going to have the logic where um, we fundamentally have these two different ways of purchasing things. Uh, one is a more uh, call it B2C uh, concept where we create ideas of things like luxury and trust and branded associations that, that are more, uh, I guess, personal in nature. And then there's this more B2B aspect of purchasing that is more of a strict value exchange. And uh, both of those branded experiences and those uh, value experiences are important uh, as part of that ethical concern. Um, we, we have to make these uh, considerations of what are we actually getting and how much do each of these areas of perception and then quantitative value, um, how much do each of those matter to me at the end of the day and how much of that should be part of this ethical behavior or these transactions that come into play. So uh, all of that comes into that thought process every time we are thinking about AI. And frankly, a lot of that is hard to compute or code or create from a workflow based perspective <laughs> yeah no that that's that's an excellent point because you know i've gone back and forth for years in terms of personalization and marketing and how do you you get smaller and smaller lists but at a certain point it's the law of diminishing returns and you're like am i really getting anywhere it's a very difficult thing to manage and it continues to be difficult i think one of the cool things about machine learning in general is that it can auto classify and auto categorize and do some of these things for us to help us along the way and that's going to be some good stuff but don't touch that doll folks we'll be right back you're listening to dm radio <laughs> All right, folks, back here on DM Radio with an all-star cast today. Sam Holzman is dialing in, Hyone Park, Jim Stern, and Joseph Gaska. And Joe, uh, Hyone, threw this one over to you before the break, the ethics of the data that you're using. I mean, what you folks have done at Grax is to focus on allowing companies to store their transactional data, their historical data, such that they can use it later on to do machine learning and to do personalization and things of this nature. And uh, so you, out of the box expressed some respect for ownership of the data. And of course, these models, large language models have been trained on data at large, basically. But what are your thoughts about you know, the ethics of that data being used and for what purpose? And of course, that's kind of what GDPR was all about. But what do you think, Joe? Well, this is a huge topic. But I mean, if you get into not only ethics, but data privacy and compartment, compartmentalization of the data in respect to who you're giving a personalized answer to or recommended recommendations to. If you think of almost people using and engaging with your product that are paying customers and people that are in the public that are engaging, how do they engage with your business? You have specific knowledge about how they're using your product and how they're engaging with your business, which will impact how you're gonna answer a question, whether it's personalized with their question recommended on their behavior and their actions. So for example, if someone's using your product and they file a case, and you can, you can index what the sentiment is to that case. You can give a personalized answer to affect their customer satisfaction score. That's very private and sensitive data where it's not a public answer or a public you know, algorithm that has access to that data itself. So we're seeing a massive division between how people are building their algorithms and approaches to intelligence from both a public segment of their business as well as their, as well as their private side of their business. So when they're driving these agents, the most critical piece that we're seeing the largest growth, they're seeing how do people 
impact their customer satisfaction score internally and be more personalized with how they're addressing and when they're addressing. So if they're using their product more or they have more cases or they have a negative sentiment with your, your support team, how do you engage and drive your customer satisfaction score, increase it up? And that's really where it comes down with historical data and how do you consume that historical data itself to drive more intelligent decisions? And there's a wealth of technologies out there. It used to start with analyzing analytics and, and looking at trends and trying to respect that. Now they're trying to go more autonomous saying, here's a recommended action that we can take with our support team based on all of our history with our clients as a whole. And then based on just this client. So if you look at segmentation and compartment, compartmentalizing the data, not only at the business level, but at the customer level itself, how do you answer that? And how do you actually be more successful in driving that engagement? So we're definitely seeing multiple layers of people using their history to give more personalized answers, as you guys have said. Uh, but it has to be very specific in, in context to what they're doing. So we're seeing this across the board. The biggest spend right now that we're seeing is people really driving the internal engagement, the real private side of their business. The whole, the whole public side of how do, how do we drive the conversion rate and how do we engage with the prospects to really convert them into paying customers? We're really seeing a division of labor and a division of this really wholeheartedly across the board. So, uh, but the ethics piece, obviously massive, massive. How do you use the data? Where do you use it? And how do you answer the questions and making sure you don't cross pollinate the data across the customers? Yeah. That's right. something is, that's the reason why we didn't, we didn't build a multi-tenant for, we do kind of single tenant deployments, super private in the customer's cloud but historical data, but it's something right now it's coming up over and over and over. And how do you protect the segmentation of those two, those two pieces that people are building up? Yeah, that's very interesting stuff. And, you know, you have this wide range of policies from one company to the next about what can be done. Of course, here in the U S it's pretty much still the wild, wild West. You could do most anything. It's starting to change. And maybe uh, Jim, I'll throw it over to you for comments. And then Hayon after that, Jim, the, the problem with, constraints in this domain is that they do wind up hindering innovation, at least to a certain extent. The problem with no constraints is that all bets are off. How, how can we find, and to Joe's point, within companies, how can we define policies that will respect the privacy of our, of our customers and even our prospects, for example, while still leveraging the power of this AI technology? What do you think, Jim? Um, well, let's see. It, it depends on on where you are corporate culture wise and where you live within the uncanny valley. So if you if I go to Amazon and it says, hi, Jim, welcome back. I expect that. That's normal. Here's everything you've purchased from us since 1995. Thank you. When when we first did personalization, we as a technology, it was AT&T who answered the phone. Hi, Mr. Stern. How can I help you? And everybody freaked out. It's like, where's the camera? Who knew you? How did you know it was me? And they learn to say, hi, it's AT&T. How can I help you? Oh, my name is, yes, I have your account in front of me, which they did as the phone was ringing. They just mm -hmm. didn't tell me that. So they didn't freak me out. <laughs> so on the one hand, are you using the information for me as a customer or about me as a prospect? And if you're using it for me, that's great. It's a service. Um, even before you know who I am, we're getting hyper-personalization now with machine learning and dynamic content, where somebody shows up on a website using your computer fingerprint, we you look like this segment of people. So we're mm -hmm. gonna show you these kinds of products on the homepage because they are most likely to convert. And after you start clicking around, it's going to subtly change. We're gonna show you different kinds of products and even change the menu in real time to match what you're looking for until You've been there for a couple of minutes and you're starting to learn the navigation system and then, okay, we'll freeze it for you. And next time you come back, that will be your experience. That's That technology exists today. And it is unintrusive. It is not, I don't think of it as being using my personal data, although it totally is, but it's for my benefit. If you, on the other hand, like many of the texts that I received during this campaign season, make all kinds of assumptions about me, that annoys me, and I and I reject them all because they overstepped the boundary. Right, I, and you know, t text messages. I got a whole ton of them myself. I just got a new phone. 
Uh, it's kind of a long story, but it's a Los Angeles number. And I'm already finding out, well, apparently Bridget used to have this number and another guy used to have this number. Like, oh, okay, look at their buying patterns. That's interesting. <laughs> and I'll throw it over to you. You know, it reminds me of, uh, you know, some of the early days of personalization where there were some pretty clumsy mistakes that were made and you have to pay close attention to it. I think the key is to have policy, think through your policy, execute the policy, and then monitor and manage and watch. And that's the other the crazy thing about machine learning is like some of these technologies like Gong that you use for sales calls that monitor the sentiment. And we use Read AI and it gives you this really interesting readout on what you've done. It's like, I mean, the boundaries of what is public, what is private are shaking right now. And uh, we do have to be careful. I think it really does come down to policy and then adherence to policy and open-mindedness about changing policy. What do you think, Hayan? Well, it's it's policy and it's also nuanced data usage. So think of the best customer experience you could possibly have. You know, call it Disney World. Snow White comes up to your, call it disabled three-year-old daughter, and it does exactly all the right things to make her feel like she's had the most important person in the world, something that Disney World is great at. You know, there, there's a lot of data uh, being processed in some way around, call it, you know, the, the disability or the language habits or what a three-year-old girl is going to think about um, that Snow White is thinking about when doing that. And that leads to a fantastic use of data and experience and call it workflow or the actual back and forth. However, if Snow White comes up to your daughter and says, oh, you went to the bathroom six times over the past day. Wow, things must really be going working well. Like that's just creepy in all sorts of different ways. Like you might have that data, but you should never use it like that. You know, right. two completely different sets of things going on. And so, you know, that's the practical aspect of having things like personally identifiable information and the right to be forgotten. Uh, these, it's a, very important to use the data in the right way, whether we're doing it uh, Ed, as a human or as an AI agent going forward, where these types of uh, understanding and capabilities need to be built into the agent to uh, provide the right kind of experience. Right. Wow. That's good stuff. Samuel, I'm going to throw it over to you to, to comment on that. I thought that was, those are very, very good analyses by Hyon and the whole group here. And the key again is human oversight, managing the situations you know i think good management is even still underappreciated maybe because there's not enough of it but good managers should be should have thick skin should know how to to calm down and not get all animated about something and just work through the process and stay focused i think we need a lot of good managers to get through this next period of time what do you think sam yeah absolutely uh, let me comment on a couple of things uh that are extremely important that that has been talked about here why are we happy with Amazon? Because the data is theirs. And they have a belief, we, excuse me, we have a belief that they're not going to mess with us. They're going to use it for our purposes. Yes, they're going to sell us stuff. They're going to try to convince us and everything else like that. It is not an internet-based data set. It mm. is their own. Mm. Disney, one of my favorite, I have to say this for full disclosure, clients, why do they call their staff members, their employees, cast members? This is management. They're putting an image in the people that work there, and their employees are called cast members. The people are called guests. Look at the relationship. These words mean something. You're coming into the park. You are a guest. The cast member is going to entertain you. That is their DNA, and they're surrounding their data sets with that understanding, so they're possibly not counting the number of bathroom visits. <laughs> but they're looking at other characteristics, which are very important. There is a legendary example at Disney University about a cast member, a janitor in the park, Someone comes up to them, a family of, of, of foreign descent, broken English, and says, please point me to uh, Frontierland. And the janitor person does a Disney point, which is three fingers, not one. Culture, 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 culture. This is mm. in their DNA. This is in their, quote, data set. This is in their training that's there and points them in a direction. There seems to be a little bit of confusion. 
The janitor again tries to, the custodian tries to explain things, and there's this bewildered look. What does he do? He takes his broom, flips it upside down with the bristles on the top, and says, follow me to Frontierland. And he oh. marches with this family to that organization. Now, that area. Think about the impact to that family and all the other people watching that personalization in real time. That's captured because of a number of reasons, and that becomes their DNA. Hmm. And that's what they're trying to leverage. So when it comes to this learning that we're talking about here, what did you say, Eric? Managers. Mm -hmm. Managers with a, 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 a culture that is ingrained not only in the manager, but they try to ingrain it in, in the staff members. Yeah, so and you know, you're, you're, you're giving me a really good idea. Maybe I'll throw it over to Jim to comment, and this segment will be done in about two and a half minutes now. But, uh, Jim, I, it's got an interesting epiphany here, thinking to myself, we have to remember all these AI technologies, they are just tools, even though sometimes they look like people when they talk, you know, the whole Turing test thing, when you're asking questions, that's a bot. They're just tools that people must wield and understand. And so in organizations, reminding people of this culturally somehow through, through management, for example, that they're just tools and that people need to manage the tools, right? So you, you don't want to just set some autonomous engine off into the world like agentic AI. You need people watching that stuff and managing it because if it goes off the rails, it goes off fast. So I think it's just important to remember they're tools. We should use them with our customers in mind, our audience in mind, our guests, for example. And I think that's going to be one of the keys to long-term success and avoiding big problems. What do you think, Jim? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can easily imagine where you create a policy and you create a bot, an agent that's responsible for the policy that monitors the other agents and then and then is turtles all the way down. Yeah. Well, this is actually very interesting. We'll pick this up in the next uh, segment here because I'm realizing that the companies that get on the forefront of this and really learn how to use it are going to do extremely well for lots of different reasons. One, let's think about sales management. You've got a sales team of, of 500 salespeople. Very, very difficult thing to manage. So typically you have senior managers mm -hmm. and you have this whole sort of pyramid going on. Well, now with Gong, it can listen to all these meetings, give reviews of all these meetings. You can have that fed into a folder where the senior manager is just reading the reviews of the reviews and throwing up, oh, this person is doing well, that person is doing well. You can identify best practices very quickly. Say, aha, this seems to be working very well. Share this with the team. As long as it's all business conversation in a business context, you can capture all that information and use the daylights out of it. Whereas before you'd have to wait for a meeting and then trust what everyone is telling you. You know, it's it's incredible the amount amount of information that decision makers can now get access to in a very short period of time is really quite compelling and it can help you do a better job because you know what most people want to do a good job there are reasons why people get off and, and stray off maybe personal reasons or they're bitter or whatever yes the, the the person with a grudge can cause a lot of trouble but if you have good policies in place and good procedures and you explain them then I think people are going to lean into these tools a lot more and get a lot more from them. But don't touch that. I'll be right back. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio. What a fantastic show. We have Samuel Holzman, Jim Stern, Hyon Park, and Joseph Gaska on the line in classic round robin fashion. And Joe, I'll throw it over to you. First, uh, you have deep understanding like Hyun about policy and understanding compartmentalization and knowing what is private, what is public, what are we trying to do, thinking about this stuff. Half the battle is just thinking about it, then designing the policy, managing the policy over time. But when I think about the possibilities, it's really remarkable how much you can excel because of how much you can know and how quickly you can know it. You can respond much faster these days than even five or 10 years ago. And that's good if you're paying attention and that's going to be humans, humans aided by machines. I think that's the key humans aided by machines, by machine learning. What do you think, Joe? Absolutely. One of the, one of the biggest things we know, we're just on the first step of a long journey. Right. And one of the most critical pieces that I love that Sam mentioned was, you know, you get into, you, like you mentioned before, managers and training, like the story about the janitor in Disney. He was obviously trained for the response and coached. 
and learned that response and that behavior over time. And right now we're learning from that because the knowledge that exists in Sam's head and sharing that story with us. So one of the most critical pieces that, that we believe in, I think we all do, is the data and data ownership is most critical. There's going to be a relentless march with Moore's law and technology and evolution that this is going to keep evolving. And there's going to be a wealth of technology providers that are going to offer different solutions, like you said, Gong, like you said, Salesforce agents, you have Microsoft Copilot, all these different technologies. But the one thing that they all need is to be trained. And how do you train it is with historical data and with data points that you're collecting. So one of the most critical pieces in why we built Grax, and, I, and I'm very passionate about that, is data ownership is the most critical piece. Protecting the protecting your data and taking ownership of it. The one thing that we built Grax is extracting every piece of every version of Salesforce history and storing it in your cloud. That's just one piece of the journey, but we always say that take ownership, put the data in your cloud store and use it to train these different technologies is the most critical piece that we're seeing because this is evolving faster than I think any of us can digest. There's different mm -hmm. players in the market, different technologies, different perceptions, different approaches. But the one piece is, if you have your data locked away from it, who owns your training set? Who owns your data? That's the biggest thing that we're seeing. You know, these, these SaaS ecosystems that are storing in the multi-tenant cloud, that world, I believe, has to kind of fall down because you need to take ownership of your AI journey itself. And the only way you do it is take ownership of your history that you're going to train, much like the janitor, much like the janitor story. I love it. It's the same thing. If you're going to train an autonomous bot to react the way you want, you have to have proper training. You have to have proper history. And without an out, governance and managers to help do that, without a doubt. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And, you know, I'm realizing and appreciating again, and I'll throw this over to Hyun Park the importance of paying attention to your data and being a good custodian of your data to use the the reference here because first of all if you turn ai agents loose on an unwieldy environment where you don't even know what's there you're going to have some problems i mean it's going to be just spitting up stuff left and right that you uh, did not want to be known which is in your data it's out there somewhere Luckily, this machine learning stuff is good at classifying and organizing and helping you manage and develop policies, but it's going to take some time. And to just set loose some algorithm inside your information environment, very, very bad idea. So I think there is now even greater impetus on organizations to be better custodians of their data and to really take that to heart. And that's why data governance is becoming such a hot topic now, right, Hayan? Yeah, absolutely. Uh for the past decade or so, about half my job has been being a business manager at this point. And one of the hardest things to do when you're running a business is always trying to figure out how do I align my sales activity, my marketing activity, my operational work, and probably nowadays, since we're all digital companies, the things that we're coding uh, internally and figure out how this all work together in terms of being able to project revenue at the end of the day and keep the business alive because there are all these hidden messages that are in the data. Uh, we're not quite sure where that data is, or it might be stuck in a silo, or we might not trust who has access to this data so it doesn't get to the right people. All these different aspects of data governance that are a real challenge right now, and that are going to cause some problems actually as we're developing these agents, because uh, at some point we have to decide who is gonna have access to say, uh, confidential sales data to make ongoing decisions. And you might say, oh, somebody in manufacturing shouldn't really have this sales data because it's very confidential in certain ways. But at the same time, they need that information to figure out how much stuff to make at the end of the day. Um, so you've got to be able to either aggregate that or pro provide it in a specific manner that gets filtered through the agent. And that governance logic will have to be agent logic as well. So it's an interesting new world, uh, definitely an architecture problem for people like Sam who have to actually deal with this in the real world, uh, obviously for Joe doing this in the data side, uh, you know, and but it affects all of us at the end of the day. I, I find this data challenge to be fundamental because it's not the only problem in AI. There is more to AI than just the data, like the logic and the processes that we've just been talking about. But data is obviously a, just such a fundamental aspect of getting this right. And frankly, we've spent the past decade dumping a lot of data into lakes and pools and swamps, right. and whatever, right. <laughs> right. without cleaning it up. So now, now the check 
uh, needs to you know get paid. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> that's that's that, right. That that's an excellent point. There is this all this data everywhere, and uh, it's relatively ungoverned. If you get right down to brass tacks, like giant S three buckets, you know, if you think like, well, what's the old joke? If you're you know a detective, you think like a criminal to go find stuff. You know, if you're a security guy, you think like a bad actor. Like, how would they do? How would they get in? What would they do? We got to kind of map all this stuff out and come up with a plan. I think that it. It is going to involve, uh, to to all of our points here, data governance, policy, data access. How do you access data? And these are, I mean, every individual organization has its own tech stack. And the no two that, organizations are the same. What do you think, Jim? The companies that I've seen that are doing it best are assigning data stewards to each pipeline. Hmm. So if something goes wrong in the back end, I mean, if you're in a factory and you're making soup and it makes people sick, let's go back. Was it the... Was it the broccoli? Was it the, the salt? Was it the water? And somebody's responsible for that supply chain. Right. So we look at data pipeline, we look at data products, and now we're going to have, uh, now we have a need for stewards for agents. If the agent puts out something that doesn't smell right, there has to be an individual, a go-to individual person to say, oh, I need to go train it better, or I need to tweak it or replace it, because we're going to have a swarm of agents doing all kinds of things we need somebody who has specific authority responsibility for a given agent at a time. So we know who to, who to talk to when something goes wrong. Well, and that's, that's my big question about AI agents and the orchestration of these little things and being able to track what they do. Is it going to be a log file? And then you have agents that have access to the log files and what looks funny and what doesn't look funny. I mean, it, you know, it could go off the rails here in places uh, fairly quickly and that could be dangerous. So even understanding, and you know, there's pressure on CIOs and CTOs to move and to brace these embrace these technologies. But it's like, how do you, how do you do that, and where does it take place? I mean, Sam, you're an enterprise architect guy. There are lots of different component parts to the enterprise architecture, and they're all under pressure right now to leverage AI to some extent, whether it's generative or the old-fashioned AI. I mean, what are your thoughts about control points from an architectural perspective? Two minutes. Well, uh, it starts It starts with the goals that you're trying to achieve, not with the data or the process. What are you trying to achieve? And from that, as we've heard, you can build representations, models of, 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 of these types of things. So within the world of enterprise architecture, the what, how, where, who, when, and why, the, the what that we're talking about is this, the data stuff. The how is the process. The what has been poorly managed. I want to mention that word because, Eric, you mentioned management. Mm -hmm. The term that I'm using is no longer management. The term that I'm using is we need better coaches. Hmm. And I want to give you, again, a little story, just a little tiny story. At my age, I've been blessed with four grandchildren. Two are nine-year-old twins, twin boys, that have taken a passion to swimming. Two boys, same age, same instruction, same everything. One is doing fabulously well, and one is not. <laughs> so one day I went to the coach and I said, hey, I got a question for you. Jacob is doing a fabulous job. Simon's having a problem. What's the issue? Simple. Jacob accepts coaching. Hmm. And this is something that we need to think about as managers are the people that we're trying to coach in these data practices, security practices, et cetera, et cetera, coachable? Do they yeah. want to change something? That's a that's an excellent point. And knowing who's coachable and who isn't, and you know, guess what? Everyone should be coachable, right? Even the <laughs> boss should be coachable because things change. Well, folks, don't touch that dial. Podcast bonus segment is coming up next. All right, folks, back here on DM Radio, top of the podcast, bonus segment, and a fantastic show. Look these gentlemen up online, Samuel Holzman from the Enterprise Architecture Institute, I believe, Jim Stern of Targeting, targeting.com, High on Park, Amalgam Insights, Joseph Gaska of Grax, and uh, Joe, I'll throw it over to you, Slop versus Sludge. We were just joking about that uh, in the break. Sludge is what uh, people are, like, is just disgusting, and Slop, Jim was saying, is what people throw on the interwebs when they just use AI to generate all this content and don't manage it. I mean, no one wants Slop or Sludge. We all want <laughs> good food and nice, clean, viscous oil. <laughs> so, like, we want to clean this thing up. 
Uh, but it's like, you, you have to keep going. You know, it's like, how do you fix a machine that's in motion? It's a very difficult thing to do. And that's kind of what we're doing in this world. But I think it does get down to the data and to the policies and practices and just staying on path, like charting a path, staying on that path until it looks like it's a lake and then you got to take a turn or something. But what, what's your advice, uh, Joe Gasca? I mean, the one thing, we all know it's unavoidable that a lot of these are going to derail themselves at some point. It's just right. managing it and making sure that you plan for that expectation because it's a large feedback loop. Mm. Right? As we're, as we're, as the, as the agents themselves are consuming data, the data itself is throwing off data, right? And it's consuming the data that's being thrown off. That's actually impacting the model, whether it's your buy, whether it's your buying pattern that Jim was talking about with Amazon, right. Or talking about, you know, the, the unfiltered consumption of what the web data is. And we've seen all of those bots go absolutely crazy. But when you talk about agents and you talk about integrating reactions for the next predicted action and agents doing those, you have to actually be very respectful for what data you're feeding into these models that are actually helping you either orchestrate business process internally with people, or if you're actually doing direct integration where you're actually impacting your business and autonomously sending emails and reactions to different different pieces. The data itself being super protective, owning your data, getting through, organizing, classifying, and that's the most critical piece. But there's never going to be a point when anybody thinks that, oh, I can set it and forget it, and these agents are gonna actually just learn and be smart and intelligent enough to do it. There's no way in heck that that is going to work in any scenario, right? You can, if you get to the 60-40, right? When you're getting into full autonomy with some of these pieces right now, that would be a success when you're getting there. But as it's modeling up and going and getting more predictive, it's bad data in, bad actions out, bad recommendations. That's the one of the most biggest pieces. And it is true. This, there is a lot of sludge that's both internal to businesses that we've all seen, right? Old data, raw data, bad data, right? That can feed in awful, awful things that happen for both predictions and recommendations as well as autonomy, right? And we're seeing that play out, but we're in step one of a marathon. Yeah, that's a good point. And maybe Jim's turn, I'll throw it over to you. And then final thoughts from Hyun, if we have time. You know, it seems to me that the key is to understand the feedback loop. As uh, as Sam said at the start, know what you're trying to achieve, implement something and watch it very, very carefully, and then have that steward who manages over time, but be careful about incredibly complex feedback loops because they're just full of noise, right? You can automate some things. You can write a piece of software that will always do what you want every time you want, and that's great. And when you start adding on and adding on, what we found is that generative AI is good at writing structured code for very specific purpose. And, and we're seeing an architecture of agents that are controlled by actors, that are controlled by directors, and they all have their specialty, but it all has to be, there has to be oversight at every step, just as there is oversight with humans who misremember, make things up, tell you what they think you want to hear, and we're accustomed to that. Now we have to learn how to do that with machines. Right. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's kind of weird. Hi, on closing thoughts from you. Yeah, so I'm bullish about the idea of agentic AI in general, but I do think that there's a big risk here in that uh, as you create, agents are very easy to create. One of the things we saw Dreamforce, Salesforce literally had us build our own agents and it was not that hard to do. So it's like if you uh, take that to its full conclusion, you've got thousands of people in an enterprise who can use Salesforce, who can all build their own agents. You start having tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of agents, just like we've seen hundreds of thousands of rules in robotic process automation, or we saw hundreds of thousands of rules in your ERP built over years and decades to customize. And we're going to need to figure out some sort of way to orchestrate all of this and to find some consistency and to figure out whose agent should be uh, more trusted than whose agent uh, from a compliance uh, perspective. You know, there's going to be a little bit of a mess that happens here. Uh, but if we can get past that and set some rules of engagement that are more consistent for these agents, uh, I I'm pretty excited about uh, what happens next. Yeah, I, I tell you what, I think it's going to be very, very interesting. I do believe this is a major inflection point in enterprise software and enterprise technology. 
And it's going to take a while because you have all these players out there. I mean, how many software as a service companies are there now? There are thousands of them. And being able to understand what they all do is basically impossible. But just know what you should use these tools for and what you shouldn't use them for. And I use these, like I use Gemini. I'm one of the weirdos who uses Gemini as opposed to ChatGPT. And I will use it to give me background on companies. And it's interesting because it gets 80% very correct and 20% incorrect <laughs> like it just gives you stuff that's not right because it's making things up right it's making things up based upon what it's seen it is getting better and better i think the accuracy will improve over time but understand that any probabilistic model is always going to be probabilistic and you want to have deterministic systems so i think that using ai fueled processes will be very very powerful but be careful about the purely generative stuff because it is going to get things wrong and if you're spending all day making sure that everything in this article is correct that you just had gen ai create did you really use the best tools and technologies in the in the wisest way the short answer is no well folks look all these gentlemen up online samuel holzman hyon park jim stern and Joseph Gaska, thanks all of you for your time. Send me an email into at dmradio.biz if you want to be on the show. Take care. You've been listening to DM Radio.